I'm Monica Blaumiller with The Mentor Project. Tonight I want to talk to you about strategy. I'll go back to the fundamentals that I learned at school and some things that I've learned along the way since then. And I'll tell you about my 2020 strategy in Africa. I'll talk about the potential impact of that in the United States. Then I'll summarize the takeaways and then it's time for questions. So back to business school. When I was at Georgetown, Phil Marino, who's a product manager at Quaker Oats for Gatorade, gave us a case study. They had, Quaker Oats had purchased from the University of Florida, the intellectual property that Phil then took to make a global brand. At least he led the team. So Florida academics created tested and patented something very valuable. It was a drink that they gave to their football team at halftime. And in the second half, the Florida State Gators came back and had a competitive advantage on the field. So Quaker Oats bought this and they defended the patent. That was intellectual property, but as patents eventually erode, they needed to keep innovating. They had competition after a while because other companies could make sports drinks. By then they had gone global and they continued to innovate and what they had developed was a hot bottling process and that was a way to deliver this to all of their locations where they were selling it at a lower cost. And then over time, they had established very strong channel partnerships that protected their market share. So if you walked into a 7-Eleven on your way to a pickup basketball game, Gatorade was in a place, one of the first places you would look. So they were selling more of that than some of the competitors. So what we learned from that at business school was that strategic advantages erode over time. And we have to continue to edify, invest, and evolve. The marketplace is global. There are regional variations. And there are always changes that we have to pay attention to. Now, since school, I've had the chance to work on some, some really interesting disruptive things, things that weren't around before, different ways of doing things. And I'd have to bring in a range of stakeholders and secure alliances with them by showing them the advantage that they would have in doing what they've done for a long time differently with me. And I had to quantify the value of making the switch in the metrics by which they're measured and in their language. So when I've talked to the Pentagon, I talked about mission readiness. When I talked to the United Nations, we talked about the humanitarian impact of a new technology. When I talk to the private sector, it's usually about the bottom line. It's better, cheaper, faster. What's the value to their shareholders? And it's important for me, if I haven't quantified this value, I haven't demonstrated the value that it's going to have, I'm asking them to take a risk with me to try something different, then I want to make it not expensive and not risky for them to try that. So a good strategy supports all of these. 2020, what have I done in 2020? What was my strategy? Well, I think we can all agree that 2020 was a black swan. Black swans were first discovered by explorers in Australia. They'd never seen a swan that wasn't white before. They never predicted it because they'd never seen one before. And a black swan event is an event with potentially severe consequences. Yeah, that describes COVID, doesn't it? When it hit, everything that I was working on went poof. The people I was talking to who were going to take a risk on taking a change with me weren't sure if that made any sense anymore. What made sense in January did not make sense necessarily in March. And we didn't know how long this was going to be. So a friend of mine said, look for the opportunity in this disruption. Every disruption is, has got a lot of opportunities. So I went back to some social entrepreneurs that I had mentored a few years ago. They had been working on improving the healthcare supply chain in Africa. 
and they were now working to improve connectivity at the endpoints in remote clinical settings in Africa. Wow, that's interesting. I'd done a TED talk in 2014 on healthcare analytics, and I'd hoped get to get back to them and some of the public health people in Africa that I had been talking to at that time. And I also was aware that the World Bank was had set aside $8 billion to shore up the economies of Africa in the same way that we had the stimulus packages here in the United States, the World Bank is trying to do that for Africa. So I went to the World Bank and I said, I can, there is a technology that we can invest in that would create some economic ripple effects. It would have private public sector partnerships. That's, that's interesting to the World Bank. It would make the healthcare systems in Africa more resilient to this and future pandemics. And Ebola's popped up in Africa again this year. It's gonna happen again. So they said, show us a viable business plan and we'll talk about investing in a pilot. Great, okay. So let's talk about the problem in Africa. Most of the records, like they used to be here in the United States, are paper. And the electronic records that they have are in all sorts of different formats and they can't talk to each other. So the IT systems and the software are so fragmented, there is no interoperability. The paper records, by the time if they get transcribed, they have errors and there's such a time lag that the data in them is meaningless. And so we don't have a meaningful overview of what the situation is on the ground. And it's hard to get critical mass because of all of this fragmentation to have a significant impact. So spend some time thinking about it. There's an American software company that has a product that can deliver interoperability of disparate data, and it operates on top of existing health record systems. They can perform artificial intelligence. They can glean some valuable insights, and then they can send feedback to those native platforms. And they don't have to disrupt the systems, the infrastructure, the software contracts that are already in place, because it's an overlay. In part two, critical mass, I initially thought that it would make sense to go into one country to do a pilot and then go to other countries. But in Africa, there are 20 or 30 cities where there's the best connectivity they have about a third of the population of that continent, the population of a continent that has 1.2 billion people. So that initial subset of people where the records, the electronic health records already exist is bigger than the size of the United States and it's growing. And so that's a good place to start. That's a good beachhead so that five or ten years we can get to a total overview of the of the continent this is a good place to start that has a critical mass and so my message now to the world bank is we can have an immediate quantifiable impact in economic stabilization that will impact hundreds of millions of people in the short term governments can demonstrate the attainment of their top goals to their constituents to the people who vote for them to whom they're accountable, and to their lenders and to donors. The private sector, we can show the opportunity for critical mass, supply chain efficiencies, and transparency. That's attractive to their bottom line, because if they can have a sense, a real-time sense of what the needs are of specific pharmaceuticals that are needed, they can produce just in time according to demand so that they're not overproducing things that are going to expire. That's good for the bottom line. And information security and privacy, we can do permissions-based information access. So each of the stakeholders can have access to the subset of information that they need. So pharmaceutical company, this is what we need to make and this is where we need to deliver it. This is what's needed now. And a clinic, 
will have information for the patients it's treating. The patient will be able to take their health record to different places where they need treatment. The overview then also of the population health that this will enable will give us an opportunity for smarter policy making and resilience in the healthcare systems in this and future pandemics. Now, future pandemics. Remember Ebola in 2014? That's been popping up again and again. And so the faster we can get to a total overview of what's going on in Africa, the faster we could stop Ebola before it gets to our country, that's a good thing for us. Remember I said I was going to get to how this potentially impacts the United States, right? But beyond keeping things like pandemics like Ebola at their source and containing them earlier, there's another impact for the United States. So our health records here are also not interoperable as we had envisioned that they would become. So our overview of population health is suboptimal. If we can prove this concept in another part of the world and have an immediate value that we deliver there, then we can take that concept and show with very low switching costs, not switching costs because you don't have to change the electronic health record systems you've already got, this will overlay. And by having interoperability of healthcare records, that would achieve a key goal of the Affordable Care Act. Experts believe that being able to do this would improve our ability to make policy decisions and it would improve healthcare outcomes. We would have better health. And right now, because of COVID, we've got much bigger health vulnerabilities than we had before. And we don't know how bad they're gonna be, but what we're seeing is, is, is worrisome, right? This interoperability can improve the affordability of care so that people with insurance can afford to have health insurance and people who are in a single payer system like Medicare or Medicaid or TRICARE, that it's more affordable for our government because right now we're spending 17, 18, 20% of our GDP on healthcare. We wanna bring that down and make it more affordable and it will improve the accessibility of healthcare. This is what experts are saying. So, okay, so takeaways. Now is a time to think and execute strategically. Strategic advantages change over time in response to changes in the marketplace in the world. We have to keep evolving our strategic advantages in response to change in the marketplace. And we need to win over critical stakeholders by quantifying how they will benefit from a change. We need to use their success metrics and their jargon, not ours. And if our solution is unproven, we have to minimize the risks of stakeholders by switching over to the new way of doing things that the disruption we're trying to launch. This is recorded, so I can't take your questions live. So here's my email address. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks to the Mentor Project.